This animation is an illustration of what geostationary satellites look like as they go around the Earth. Now these satellites are in geostationary orbits because they are stationary with respect to the surface of the Earth. And they are able to do this because of three reasons. One, they have an orbital period equal to one sidereal day, which makes them geosynchronous orbits. Two, they have an orbital inclination of zero degrees, which means that they are always above the Earth's equator, which means their orbital plane is aligned with the Earth's equatorial plane, which also means they always have a latitude equal to zero degrees. And three, their orbital eccentricity is zero, which makes them circular orbits. And these three things put together allow them to match the Earth's rotation rate and orientation, which means they are able to appear stationary from the surface of the Earth. And here are the ground tracks corresponding to the satellites in the animation, where they are all constantly hovering over the Earth's equator, so their ground tracks are just stationary points along this latitude equals zero line. And as always, leave a comment below if you'd like me to add your city into the ground track plots for future videos. This is the 38th video in the series, and in this one, I'll be going over the definition of geostationary orbits, which are a subset of geosynchronous orbits, and their associated ground tracks, which are latitude and longitude coordinates, as I showed in the previous slide, and how the moon's gravitational pull impacts these geostationary orbits, specifically covering their Keplerian orbital elements and ground track drifts over time, and finally, how numerical solvers can give different results for the Keplerian orbital elements over time for small perturbations like the gravitational pull of the moon. So to get to the definition of a geostationary orbit, there are a special case of geosynchronous orbits, which are orbits that have an orbital period of one sidereal day, which is equal to about 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. And a sidereal day is the amount of time Earth takes to make a 360 degree rotation about the inertial frame, not a 360 degree rotation with respect to the sun. And I go over this in more detail in the geosynchronous orbits video, which I'll have a link in the description to, but it's just a minor detail. And in that video, I also go over that from this period, we know that these orbits will have a semi-major axis equal to roughly 42,163.7 kilometers. And geostationary orbits are a special case of geosynchronous orbits since they have an eccentricity equal to zero, meaning they are circular orbits, and they also have zero inclination, meaning that they are equatorial, so they only go over the Earth's equator, which also means that for the ground tracks, they always have a latitude equal to zero. And you can set any geostationary orbit around any longitude depending on where on Earth you want to be looking over. So as you can see in this plot, you can pick from any of these longitudes depending on what your site on Earth of interest is that you actually want to look at with your satellite. So these orbits only stay above a certain point on Earth exactly on the equator if you assume no orbital perturbations. Now, even though the perturbations on these orbits are small, we still need to consider them in order to accurately model these orbits. So the largest perturbation and what dominates the change in orbital elements is the gravitational pull due to our moon. So on the plot on the right, you can see the orbit of the moon, which is inclined quite a bit with respect to the surface of the Earth. And the gravitational pull from the moon is going to pull on the spacecraft here that is in the geostationary orbit. There's also solar radiation pressure acting on the spacecraft, but this is very small compared to the lunar gravity. And also, the non-spherical Earth perturbations on the geostationary orbits are very small, since the farther that you get away from Earth, the more it behaves like a point mass. So the fact, and going into J2, the fact that the Earth's equatorial radius is larger than its polar radius, which is where the J2 perturbation comes from, matters way less at this distance because Earth looks a lot more like a point mass when you're so far away. This is what the Keplerian orbital elements look like for a geostationary orbit with the perturbations due to the moon's gravitational pull, J2, and solar radiation pressure. But as I said before, these trends are mostly coming from the moon, and the other two perturbations have very minimal effects for this time frame. So the most important element to look at here is the orbital inclination, which is secularly increasing over time due to the pull of the moon. This matters for geostationary satellites because the farther the orbit gets from zero inclination, the less geostationary it is, thus it's going to be oscillating around the equator instead of being constantly on it. And we can get a glimpse of why this is happening by looking at the moon's orbit in the Earth equatorial inertial frame, which is shown in this plot here. 
So the moon has an inclination that varies between roughly 18.3 and 28.6 degrees with respect to Earth's equator, which is obviously greater than zero. So the moon's pull influences the geostationary orbits, which have an inclination of zero degrees, to increase over time. And I'll do a video on our moon's orbit in the future because it's very interesting and very unlike other moons in the solar system. So the change in inclination can be seen in the ground tracks here as over time, the change between the top and the bottom of where the orbit is with respect to the equator, which is the latitude equals zero line, is increasing over time. So going from here all the way over, you can see that it increases as the plot in the previous slide says by around 0 0.6 degrees. So it hovers around 0 0.6 and negative 0 0.6 degrees above the latitude. And this might not seem like very much. It seems like a very small angle, but this orbit is actually drifting very far away with respect to the surface of the earth. And we can see a few different cities here in South and Central America kind of for reference of how far this drift actually is over a year if it is left uncorrected. The Keplerian orbital element plot I showed before was made using a run cut of 4 or 5 method to solve the ordinary differential equations of motion, which is the plot on the top right here. But numerical solvers aren't perfect, and they can actually come up with very different answers, which matters when talking about small orbital perturbations, like in the case here of geostationary orbits. So these three plots show the results of three different solvers integrating the same equations of motion, which include Earth gravity, lunar gravity, J2, and solar radiation pressure. And they mostly all agree on the elements, except for the semi-major axis, which is related to the energy of the orbit. So as the semi-major axis increases, the energy of the orbit increases. So on the top right, we have DOPRI-5, which is a run cut of 4-5 solver, shows that the semi-major axis is oscillating over time. And on the bottom right, we have ZVODE, which is, shows the semi-major axis decreasing by roughly 175 kilometers. And on the bottom left, we have El Soda, which shows the semi major axis increasing by about 600 kilometers. And it's not really immediately obvious which, if any, of these solvers are the most accurate in modeling this specific differential equation. And to be honest, I'm not 100% sure which one I trust the most in this case, but I'm thinking that the oscillating case here makes the most sense intuitively, but it's just by process of elimination, since in my mind, it doesn't make sense that the semi major axis would increase for a bit and then decrease secularly for the rest of the year in the ZVO case. And it also doesn't make sense to me that the semi major axis would increase, but at a slowing rate. So the rate of change of the semi major axis is decreasing over time, which doesn't really make much sense to me because the geostationary orbit is circular and the moon's orbit is roughly circular. So would it make sense that it would be changing like that over time, at least in my mind. And so this gets into the concept of energy drift of numerical solvers or numerical integrators, which I'll be covering in more detail in the numerical methods with Python series. So that's pretty much it for this video. Be sure to hit like and subscribe if you liked the video to help me out with YouTube algorithm. And also let me know in the comments if there was anything that was confusing or anything else that you'd like me to go over about geostationary orbits. And for the next few videos, I'm going to kind of go in a different angle and make a fundamentals of orbital mechanics video series because I feel like in this series, I haven't gone into depth at all in a lot of really important things to understand fundamentally about orbital mechanics. And these are a few examples of what those things are. Uh, one of the big things, or the first two are the really big things of why is an orbit even possible. So why is it important to have velocity that is tangent to your precision vector? And also the Keplerian orbital elements. I've gone over them very briefly in a few different cases. So I want to go over them in a more formal and concrete way to give a better understanding of them. And these are just a few ideas. So again, let me know any questions or comments that you have in the comments section. And thank you for watching.